Welcome to this educational presentation on ependymomas and the activities of CERN. I'm glad to be joined today by several CERN investigators. Let's take the time now to talk about treatment of ependymoma. Dr. Gilbert? Thank you, Terry. So the treatment of ependymoma um, has several components to it which have been very well established. And the first, which is very critical, is the surgical component. After a, a person has been diagnosed as having a tumor, whether it's in the brain or spinal cord, it is very important to determine what type of tumor it is. We can often get a clue from the imaging characteristics of that tumor and suspect that it may be an ependymoma. An ependymoma is one of the, the central nervous system tumors that is um, very much benefited, and patients are benefited by um, extensive surgical removal. So it is certainly our goal uh, when we are, are taking care of our patients that we make a connection with neurosurgeons uh, of the highest caliber so that they are able to do safe but very thorough resections of that tumor. That does two things. First, it gives adequate amount of tissue for our neuropathology colleagues to make a definitive diagnosis. And it also puts us in the direction of optimal treatment. There are some ependymomas which, if removed completely, may be cured. For example, in adults, the myxopapillary ependymoma often grows as a capsule. And if it is removed with the capsule intact, that patient is often cured. Similarly, for the low-grade ependymomas, we often, if we get a very good and extensive surgical resection, just observe that patient. For the, in the case of the higher grade or more malignant ependymomas, which we call anaplastic ependymoma, an extensive surgical resection clearly puts us ahead of the game and makes it much more viable to consider additional therapies to, to have a very positive effect in controlling disease and, and probably prognosis. So amongst brain tumors in general, ependymoma is one of the tumors that clearly there's an, an association between extensive surgery, successful surgery, and outcome. I did mention that in some cases we do need to do additional treatment and radiation treatment, usually restricted to the area of the tumor, is often used, particularly when the, the surgeon is unable to safely remove all of the tumor, or in the case of the more malignant anaplastic ependymoma, because even when we don't see any tumor, we know it's quite likely that there are residual tumor cells. The radiation, as I mentioned, is typically focused to the area of tumor, with the exception in situations where the tumor has spread outside of that local area and is in other points in the nervous system. Oftentimes, this requires radiation to both the brain and spinal cord to encompass all the areas of, of where the tumor may be, even if we can't see it on our imaging studies, we presume that there may be microscopic spread. There's also potentially a role of chemotherapy, and I'd like to ask Amar uh, to expound on that. So chemotherapy has been used a lot more in children than in adults because the children, uh, particularly the younger ones, present a very unique problem. Uh, the brain maturation is a continuous process which takes place from birth all the way to uh, in the late teens or early 20s. And there's a great hesitation among us treating physicians to expose a very young brain to radiation therapy because uh, some, unfortunately that has long-term long neurocognitive consequences. So we use chemotherapy for two reasons. Number one, if a child is very young, we use chemotherapy to try to control the tumor, to let the child grow a little older and let the brain mature and then use local radiation therapy to try to reduce some of the long-term complications. Another use of chemotherapy, which is critical, is as Mark mentioned, getting gross total resection of the tumor is a key component of long-term disease control. Sometimes the surgeon goes in over there and can't just get all the tumor out. So many a times we use chemotherapy to try to treat the tumor. And in our experience, um, what we found out is the surgeon can go back in a second time, mm -hmm. then try to resect the tumor, and after chemotherapy exposure, the tumor is very much easier to resect. So it sort of serves as a bridge to help the neurosurgeon try to do his job in an easier way without damaging the child. There is a small subset of patients, uh, we think, that can be cured with uh, surgery and chemotherapy alone. In a rough, rough, about 15 to 20% of the patients, we can't pick them up right now, but we hope that the work that we do with uh, 
Ken and Richard in the laboratory may help us identify some of these tumors and we can treat them with chemotherapy so that they don't have to go through radiation therapy at all in their lives and don't have some of the long-term consequences of radiation therapy. So again, this is chemotherapy in the children a younger age group. Chemotherapy is also used in the adults, Mark, and uh, you may want to add. So in the adult, we have less concern about the developmental consequences of radiation, as, as you so eloquently discussed. Um, but we do have concerns about too much radiation. And so after somebody has undergone a course of radiotherapy, the risk of injury with a second course of radiation therapy increases. So there's been increasing interest in developing chemotherapy regimens. And I think this is one of the real strengths of CERN. I think in CERN we have this structure, this collaboration, and we have a, a very, very strong program that's looking at developing new, new therapies. And I'd like to ask Richard to expound on that. Sure. So I think a key point that Mark and, and Amar both brought out is that we have good treatments at the moment, but they're still suboptimal. We still don't cure all patients. And so how can we get around that? And so some of the unique relationships that we have in CERN are really great drug development expertise. And there are two approaches that we're taking that are somewhat complementary. So the first approach is basically to take drugs that are already available in the clinic. And, and in fact, we're uh, looking at about 320 FDA-approved compounds already. And the reason why we're looking at those is because, because ependymoma is rare, which limits the clinical trials we can do, not all of those drugs have been tested in patients with ependymoma, but it doesn't mean that they won't work. And so we've been able to use the model systems in the laboratory to take 320 compounds that were handpicked by our collaborators in CERN and look for those drugs that are already in the clinic so we can get fastest to patients with ependymoma drugs that may be working. And we've had some exciting results in that that have already identified existing chemotherapies that may well work. And so they're gonna be going into patients um, soon, which is very exciting. And then there's the other drugs which are not yet available for patients um, that are being developed. And how, how can we get an idea of whether they will work? And so we're using those as well in these same model systems. And then a complementary approach taken by other members of CERN is really to build compounds from the ground up that we suspect may work in this disease because of the biology. And so building chemicals that actually will target particular abnormal proteins in ependymoma specifically. And so those two approaches are really giving us an exciting way, which I think really has not been done in any other tumor so comprehensively to link the biology with the clinic. Are there current clinical trials that are available to both adults and children with ependymoma through CERN? So there are, right now, there's a, uh, a clinical trial specifically for, for uh, children with, with recurrent ependymoma and a complementary trial in, the, in uh, the adult population. Both are actively accruing. Um, and uh, as Richard discussed, we are developing a pipeline and have a roadmap of bringing on new studies. And we anticipate um, several new clinical trials over the next several years. Um, and so we would certainly encourage people to participate in CERN um, and to be kept informed. Even if they don't need treatment now, uh, there may be a need in the future. And they, I, I think, would benefit from the educational opportunities in CERN and having access uh, to a, a group of people who are dedicated to, to advancing knowledge and treatment of, of, of ependymoma and also have the expertise um, to help them out. I think one of the exciting things about CERN is that uh, in these clinical trials, we're also collecting tumor tissue. In the past, clinical trials did not uh, really collect tumor tissue, so we weren't t getting a an appreciation of the molecular subtypes. So with clinical trials uh, that the CERN is involved in, uh, we can begin to find uh, molecular subtypes which might predict response to therapy and so that we could tailor therapy, both radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and drug design to the individual patient. Thank you all again. It's been a fantastic discussion. I appreciate your time. Thank you.